Okay. Hey, we're recording. Let me just do a brief intro. So yep. um, this is sort of part of my informal uh, libertarian answer man series. So people ask me questions and I usually offer to help sometimes in on a phone call because it's quicker than email. And if I do it, I want to record it so other people can listen. So I dupli don't duplicate effort all the time. Anyway, so Shia, is that your name? Shay? Sorry, Shay. Shay. Yeah. Shay asked me a question. So I thought we would just talk about it here. I vaguely recall what it was about, something about how contracts of sale can be valid for value if you don't own it, something like that. So um, this will be KOL something. I don't remember which episode it will be. But uh, so tell, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who, so who are you, where you're from? Sure, yeah. So um, I'm a fellow Louisianian, actually, like yourself. Um, I, uh, I work in mental health. I'm a therapist in private practice, actually, by profession. Before I went to grad school for um, mental health and psychology, though, I did my undergrad in um, like international studies and politics and things at LSU, um, your alma mater, as I see your hat Oh, there. really? In, the, in yeah. the poli sci department or what department? Uh, well, it was the interdisciplinary international studies major that they created well, I was there at least 10 years ago, so they must have created that 15 or 20 years ago. So, you know, it was aspects of political science, anthropology, um, like kind of all of the social sciences, but just an was emphasis. That guy, uh, was that guy Ellis Sandals there then, the guy that's a big Vogelin nut? Yeah, Vogelin was like a big deal there. I don't think I took a class with that guy, but I no, know. No, no, Vog Vogelin's long gone, but it was Ellis right. Sandals was sort of his uh, his uh, his his uh, sort of follower and – I think there. I think he wrote a book about him. And then one of my law professors, Robert Pascal, well, he wasn't my professor, but he was a friend who was a law professor. He was a huge Vogel and nut too. Yeah. Um, I didn't know that specific guy that you mentioned, the the guy who was kind of like a student of Vogel. And I don't think yeah. I took a class with him, but well, I think he was like the head of the poli sci department or something, Ellis Sandoz, but that may be in the okay. old, maybe that may be from years ago. He may very well have been there. Like I said, it was like an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary program I did. So I was taking classes in a lot of different subjects and I took some political science classes, but I wasn't only in that department. So I was kind of hopping around a lot. Um, but yeah, I, I picked up on like the Vogelin thing. Cause I remember even in like the, the bookstore, they had like a whole bunch of Vogelin stuff and they're kind of yeah. trying to yeah, promote he's got it. Like a, he's got like a 30, 40 volume set of the collected works. I've got three or four of them. I've read some of them. What do you think of him? I've never really actually got into got into his work. He sounds like he's kind of compatible with what our stuff, but he's murky, like Hayek or like uh, or, you know Heidegger or something. I mean, he's he talks about Gnosticism, uses all these weird made up terms. Yeah, uh, I never got much out of him. That I I read the New Science of Politics closely, and I got some nuggets out of it, but I can't remember them. So he's not a systematic thinker in the in the system that I'm interested in anyway. Right. But um, Maybe right. someday I'll get back to it. But uh, yeah. so are you in Louisiana now still? Uh, yeah, I live around Lafayette. I kind of moved around and lived in some different places and ended up back over here. And um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm doing teletherapy like for all of my work now in this post-COVID time, you know. Well, I, I got a good friend, Anthony, Anthony Samaroff, who's here in Houston for a few weeks. He's a he does teletherapy, too. Um, yeah, I just saw him last night. He was telling me all about it. And he mm -hmm. he lives around the world and just does his work from wherever he is like thailand or costa rica or mexico or here or, or whatever right right yeah it is pretty cool although it does bring up depending on the field you're in um issues of like regulation and licensing between states and things like that that's a whole another topic right there well not everyone's licensed. license <laughs> what's that yeah not everyone's licensed <laughs> right right yeah i know and again that's a whole another topic uh not too far off from issues of intellectual property and things, you know, obviously not um, the same issue, but still within the domain. So are you a libertarian, Austrian and all that, or what's your, what's your sort of ideological background? I would say I kind of lean libertarian. I wouldn't consider myself a full-blown like Austrian devotee, although I've kind of dabbled in it more in the last couple of years than anything else and more than I ever have, if that makes sense. Um, I would say I was pretty standard, like sort of left leaning kind of person just in my undergrad years. A lot of the stuff actually that I got at LSU was your run of the mill kind of Marxist socialist stuff about yeah. how like global capitalism was like, you know, is so evil. Um, and, you know, I had to read the communist manifesto for one of my uh, anthropology classes and uh, 
all that kind of thing, right? So uh, I, I'm, I was, I'm always surprised. I'm always surprised that people, these conservatives and libertarians who hate college usually because they can't afford it, so they have to bash it. So mm -hmm. they, they bash all the elite schools in the Northeast like they're lefty and that you should send your kid to LSU and or like or some, some southern public state school. Right. And I'm like, what makes you think they're not lefty too? They're all, they're all hit by it, I think, pretty much. Yeah, they are. They definitely are. I mean, uh, for, for at least one reason, which is that a lot of the professors are, you know, have gotten their PhDs at those schools, right? So this one particular professor I just mentioned got his, I think his PhD at Oxford. So in that case, it's England, but pretty much yeah. in the same fold. And um, I will say, though, you know, it varies by discipline, right? So sure, um, sure. I remember uh, one that really stood out was I had uh, an American history professor who was clearly kind of more towards the conservative type. And I think that fits more with some Again, some disciplines, maybe some historians, especially well, again being an American history guy. Uh, although well, that could go the other way, you could have a, you could have some really far left American history people. True. Uh, yeah, I had a really conservative one there, John Culbertson. God damn it! Hold on. Put my computer on. I always forget to turn everything on. Don't disturb. Yeah. And if I don't, someone's gonna freaking call me. Um, move this one, dude. Don't disturb. Um, okay. Yeah, I was in engineering, so it wasn't corrupt. I don't know if it is now, but it, it wasn't political at all. And even law school at LSU was, was not that political, except the politics embedded in the law, the legal doctrines themselves. But, um, yeah. Um, do you think okay, that, law so, do you think law ahead. professors, do you think law professors in general have a kind of political bias, like just overall on average? I think so. Um, but it's a pragmatic discipline, so a lot of them are just pragmatic. And yeah. I, but I don't know how to compare. I mean, I, it's been thirty years since I've right. been, so I don't know how they are now. Yeah. Um, so how did you end up following my comments or whatever made you? If you're not really that into it, are you just following libertarians to some degree or something or what? To some degree, I uh, just kind of read a lot online in the area. You know, just consuming a lot of the content out there on YouTube and elsewhere. And um, again, just always been very interested in political philosophy, political theory. I started okay. to get really heavily into issues around intellectual property recently, um, which I know we'll dive into um, today. Um, and just trying to really kind of figure out the dynamics there. There's some confusing issues, and uh, obviously that's something that you have really kind of need mm -hmm. you know a, a, a specialization uh, you know perhaps yeah. among other things that you've worked on so okay I so why don't you shoot stuff. tell me tell me what your kind of tell me what your questions are and i'll be happy to try to field them yeah okay so first you you know i think you give a lot of really good uh arguments and rationale behind um the anti-ip position in general um and we can dive into that if you'd like, uh, but the point at which I kind of came to you and started to ask some questions was kind of assuming that that's the case. In other words, assuming yeah. that we're going to say that intellectual property is a uh, non-starter, that you can't have property in information, um, then my, my question was, is it okay, quote unquote, I guess, according to some libertarian principles or moral principles that we may agree on, to sell information oh, right. intellectual product right. so it was that kind of issue like right, right. between selling and if you can't own it yeah. how can you sell it so one of the right. things you gave me and the information you shared with me is an article that literally um goes directly to that issue which is where you make the point quoting others uh who have talked about this issue where ownership and uh being able to sell something are they're not necessarily linked they're distinct right, right? so you can yeah you can just because you can sell something doesn't mean you own it and vice versa. And there's Correct. some examples within that domain that you kind of flesh out and, and highlight to, to make that point. Um, well, and it, it depends on what you mean. So here's here's where precision and definitions uh, is necessary, because it depends on what you mean by sell. So if by sell you mean transfer the title to an owned resource, then you can't sell an idea. But if you just mean something different. You can, and I'll, I'll I'll go into that. I, and I think what most people mean is the second meaning, which is an economic or descriptive meaning. Um, what they really just mean is 
they're explaining why you did something. So when we when we look at human action, and this is Mises, we always characterize every action as the person is aiming at some end goal. Some so he has some purpose. He's trying to achieve some end result. That's the end of his action, and he uses some means to achieve that. So when we see him behaving. We assume he's acting because he's like us, and acting and behaving are different. Behaving is just his motions. Acting means we assume he he has a, a, a mentality and a consciousness, and a, he has an internal purpose. So we observe his behavior, and we infer from that, knowing how we act, we make some inferences about the characterization of his action. So if someone hands a dollar to someone for a newspaper, because we've done that, we assume he's not just in a… Tr- sleepwalking or in a coma or a robot, we assume he's doing it, and his purpose is to get the newspaper. Now, it could be that he's playing some game where he's really trying to to trick the guy or play a practical joke, but you know, we, we have to make assumptions. So we characterize people's actions by assuming what the purpose is, and when we do that, we're just explaining what they're doing. So if I, <laughs> if I hand you a dollar <laughs> for a newspaper, we would say it seems like the reason the guy gave the dollar was to obtain the newspaper, so the end of his action was to obtain the newspaper, right? But the thing is not not every end of an action is the acquisition of an ownable thing. In fact, I would say that's only a, a tiny subset of all actions. Every action has some end goal, some something you're trying to achieve, which just means you're trying to change the future universe from the way it would otherwise be. So in a sense, every action is the action of a mini god. We're like little creators trying to create a new universe. That is, we're trying to create a universe in the future that would be different than the one that would that would occur if we didn't intervene. And we intervene by causally affecting it by employing causally efficacious means. Um, so sometimes you want to obtain the possession of something. So for example, Crusoe on his island, there's no such thing as ownership or rights because there's no other people, and rights and ownership are social relationships. Um, so he just wants the possession. So if he wants a fish because he's hungry, he 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 imagines a future where he's going to be hungry or hungrier than he is. And that that idea fills him with um what does Mises call it? Um, um no, he got a word, not dissatisfaction, but um, uh, I'll, I'll think of it in a second. It's, it's a classic word Mises uses. Like it, it's a psychological motivation to act. When mm-hmm. when you imagine something and it, oh, it makes you uneasy. So because you're uneasy about the future that you envision that's coming, you want to intervene and try to change it. So you want to possess a fish so you can feed yourself. So you you go about you know getting a net or getting a spear or something like that. And catching the fish. That's your means, right? Does that make sense so far? Yes, it does. So in that case, you wanted to possess a fish. In another case, you might want to relax at the end of the day's work. This is Crusoe again by himself. And you just you might want to just climb up on the on the hill and see the sunset. So you use your legs and maybe you use your shoes as your means, and you climb up the hill and you rest and you see the sunset. So you you in both cases you achieve a profit, a psychic profit. Because you achieved what you wanted to achieve, and you've made the world better than it would have been from your subjective point of view. Um, in one case, the object of your action was to, to possess an object that you can use. In the other case, it was to just experience something that you wanted to experience, like seeing the sunset. Okay? Mm-hmm. That makes sense? Yes. Now, when we come to other people, you have economic exchange. Now, I'm not talking legal exchange, just economic. Exchange just means you're, you're – you're trading something that you have for something else that you prefer, and it, just like in the fish or the sunset example, sometimes the the goal of your action is an experience or a state of affairs, and sometimes it's the acquisition of an object that you can possess and use and control. Right. So I might give you an apple for your orange because the goal of my action is to acquire the possession of an orange, right? Mm-hmm. Or I might give you an apple. To get you to smile at me, right? So in both cases, I'm I'm giving the app the the apple or the orange to induce you to do something. Okay. In mm-hmm. one case is to induce you to give me something that you control, and the other case is to give for you to do something, perform an action that I want you to perform. Okay. Right. Now, when we come to a more sophisticated society where there's not just people who trade, but there's also 
legal norms that arise that protect the rights in these things because if I possess an apple or an orange, it's always at risk of being stolen from me by other people, right? So people are, are a benefit because we can trade with them, but they're also a risk because they are they have free will and they might choose to use my scarce, my scarce resources that I have possession of. Mm -hmm. So property rights arise to give um, – hold on just a second. telling my nanny to go. Okay, so property rights arise to give you extra security in the possession of something by giving you a legal right to it. That's what ownership is. Ownership is the legal right to control a resource. So it's distinct from possession. Possession is the capacity or ability to use it or control it, uh, which Robinson Crusoe has, mm -hmm. uh, and which we have in society. But we have ownership in addition to that to give us even more security of using it. And that allows us to – you can do longer-range plans with it. So you have longer range production processes, which makes us richer um, and you know makes everyone better off. It allows us to trade and cooperate peacefully instead of having fights with each other, which is also inefficient and unpleasant. Um, so in that context, an exchange has a legal meaning too. So it means that in a simple example of a, of a contemporaneous exchange of two owned objects, like I own my apple, you own your orange because – I keep switching my objects, but you get the idea. Yeah. Um, because um, uh, we have property rules that are widely respected in society where people respect these property assignments um, because I picked the apple and you picked your orange, so we each own them. And so we can exchange them economically, That like, and economically just means it's the explanation of why we did it. Right, it's just a characterization of the means and the ends that we employ, but legally the titles transfer as well. So I give you the, which one do I have? <laughs> the apple or the orange? Let's pick one. I've got uh, the orange. Okay, I've got, got the orange. You got the I apple. Think that, okay. I think that's how you started with the orange. All right, the orange. I've got my orange, and I, I I transfer the title of it to you in exchange for you. And when I say in exchange for legally, that means I make it conditional upon you doing something. So I, I hand you possession of it, and I give you ownership conditional upon you doing something else, which is you giving yours to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, And that's a contract. That's what contract is. Contract is the owner transferring the title to it, the legal ownership of it to someone else. So mm -hmm. in those kind of exchanges, there are legal exchanges, so there's a two-way transfer of title. My, my orange now is owned by you, and your apple is now owned by me, and at the same time, the possession usually transfers too. It doesn't have to be. They could be distinct. You and I can make a contract where – like you're, you're in one town, and I'm in another town, and we could be on the phone, and we could make a deal. So I say, okay, I hereby sell my apple to you, and you sell your – I sell my orange to you. You sell your apple to me. So when the deal is done… The ownership has been transferred, but now we're each in possession of each other's property. So now we have to go find each other and make the physical exchange. Mm -hmm. Okay, So there could be a, a moment of time where ownership and possession are not the same thing, which is the same thing, for example, if you loan someone something. Like if you, borrow, if you rent a car from Hertz mm -hmm. or Avis, you have the ability to use the car temporarily and for certain limited uses. Yeah. But they still own it, and you have to give it back at the end of the, of the, of the lease term, right? Yeah, that makes sense. I was actually about to ask you, is that equivalent to, say, like a landlord and a tenant just in a home? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Or if or if you invite some people over for dinner, so they, they have permission to use your house because you're the owner. You can think mm -hmm. of that as a contract, and that's called license. That's what license means. License just means permission. Everyone call, talks about like a software license, but license just means permission, and permission right. presupposes you're the owner because if you're not the owner of the resource that the, that the licensee – or the permittee is using, then they wouldn't need your permission. They only need your permission because you're the owner. Okay. So contract and license and permission and invitations all and consent, all that are secondary principles that that rest upon the more fundamental principle of property. Property means and property in a sense rests upon possession. So possession is the is the physical act. Property is the legal right. I'm sorry. Possession is the is the is is the actual 
capacity to control and possess and use a resource to employ it. And property is the legal right that protects that. And then contract would be the exercise of ownership by the owner of the property resource he owns to either deny permission or grant permission or license to other people or to transfer it altogether in the terms of a not a temporary loan like a car or a lease um but but an outright transfer like the apple and orange case right yeah yeah and it could be it can be unconditional or it could be conditional it can only be unconditional if it's simultaneous and contemporaneous and that is right now because if it's if it's done in the future it's always conditional because the future is uncertain so even mm -hmm. if i say so usually it's conditional upon some other action unless it's a donation or a gift um, so if I give you the apple, I'm giving it to you on condition that you give me the orange. I'm sorry, vice versa. If I give you the orange, it's conditioned upon you giving me a real apple that's not rotten, not a plastic apple, uh, and not withholding the apple, right? So yeah. there's a condition there. I could give it to you unconditionally. I could say, I hereby give you an orange in 10 minutes just as a gift. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a contract, and it's enforceable. But it's still conditional because the orange might not exist in 10 minutes. Something might happen in between now and then. So right. every future contract is always conditional, mm -hmm. which is why it's not fraudulent if you fail to fulfill a future contract. It's just uh, – it's, it's maybe what you could call breach, but it's not necessarily fraudulent. It's fraudulent if you're lying at the time you make the deal, like you pretend like you have an apple, but it's really a fake apple mm -hmm. right, or something. But if you fail to deliver on a contract in the future, that's never fraud. People confuse that one too. Okay, so um, if you don't if you don't pay back debts in the future, that's not fraud. No, it's not fraud. It's not theft either. It's simply, and if you if you if you understand contracts not according to the standard conventional legal sense and the economic sense prevalent today, which is that contracts give rise to legally enforceable or binding obligations. Mm -hmm. So if I promise to give you an orange in ten minutes and then I fail to do so. Uh, I mean, let's say I'm going to drive. I promise to do it. I'm going to drive by the store and buy it and give it to you. But mm -hmm. I go to the store and they're out of oranges, so I can't fulfill. Yeah. The, the law right now would view that as a breach of contract. And when there's a breach, that means I owe you consequential damages. Okay, so mm -hmm. I still owe you some money. The way Rothbard and I would look at it is, a contracts are only what I described earlier. They're the exercise of of the power to consent or exclude others or to transfer ownership by the owner. So all contracts are really just transfers of title to things that you own. Mm -hmm. So, but if I'm transferring title now to a future orange, that's uncertain and necessarily conditional on the orange existing. So if it doesn't exist when I'm supposed to transfer it to you, there's nothing to steal. So it can't be theft. The orange just doesn't exist. Right. The orange in my possession. So the orange in my ownership has to exist for me to transfer it to you. But if I don't have it, then I can't steal it. So, yeah, that clears up the that clears up the debtor's prison issue. Now, what so, would so, happen is what would happen is you'd have an ancillary, uh, an ancillary title transfer, which would be that um, I owe you money, I owe you monetary damages equal to the value of the orange um, as soon as I come into it, into possession of it, or something like that, or ownership of it. So you would have you couldn't get out of a debt by just being bankrupt on the day you owe it uh the debt would accrue with interest or something like that because that's yeah. what most people would agree to right but that would still be just a title transfer to an owned thing and a future thing that's uncertain so yeah. you may never get paid back because the guy never make he may be dead before the contract happens you know before right. the transfer happens right. um so in any case um we call that an exchange because it is it's 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 both an economic exchange. In other words, both parties did something for a certain reason mm -hmm. to obtain something they want, and that the end of that happened to be the possession and ownership of an owned thing, and that's legally called an exchange too. But if I pay you to induce you to do something else, like to perform an action, which some people might call labor, but labor is just a subset of action because action is leisure and labor. It's like two types of action, right? So let's just say action. I want you to perform an action. So I pay you money or I agree to pay you money in the future or I pay it to you now either way, and I do that to induce you to do something. Now, that's the economic description of it. Okay, mm -hmm. So it's an exchange because I am, I am trading my possession and ownership of my property, 
my orange in order to get something that I want, which is for you to perform an action. Mm -hmm. And you're engaging in this action, which is labor to you. It's just a disutility yeah. because otherwise you would do it without me inducing you to do it. Right. You're doing that to get ownership and possession of the orange. So that's the explanation of our action. So economically, it's an exchange. And by analogy, we call that a sale or an exchange in the law, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. We're basically fitting into the same category because it looks the same, but it's really a one-way transfer of title instead of a two-way because what happens is I'm giving you ownership of my orange, and you're performing an action. Mm -hmm. So there's only one title that's been transferred. That's the ownership of my apple because you don't own your actions. Your actions are just – you own your body, and that gives you the ability to do something or to refuse to do something. So right. I know that, and you know that, so I know that I have to induce you to get off your ass and do what I want you to do, right? right? Yes. So we call it a sale of labor because that's a way to describe the economic side of it, mm -hmm. and it leads to confusion because then people start saying something like, well, in a, normal, in a normal exchange of two objects like an orange and an apple, when we call it an exchange or we call it a sale, like you're selling your apple to me for my orange, I'm mm -hmm. selling my orange to you for your apple… It does imply a title transfer too. It implies that we each own those things. So then when we use loose language and we say, well, if I, if I pay you my orange to get you to labor for me, we can call it you sold your labor and I sold my orange. And then people naturally assume, well, if you sell something, you must own it. Right. But you can see you don't. You don't own it actually. Right, right. Does that all make sense? It, it, it does. You said earlier that uh, one thing that stood out was um, labor. First of all, labor is just a subset of action. Yeah, leisure right? and labor is how economics sub, subdivides it. And then um, it's, sort of like it's sort of like consumption goods and production goods. We don't right. really want production goods for themselves. We want them because they help us get consumption goods, which we consume and we enjoy. Um, so leisure's labor is more like the more like the production good, and leisure is more like the consumption good. Leisure is something you do for its own sake, yeah, for the for the enjoyment of living. Labor is something you do that you have to do that's somewhat unpleasant in order to be able to have leisure at some points, or or to survive, or to get something you want. Right, and and another thing to hear that I think is important is how you you highlighted how to a, to obtain ownership of something is only also a subset of human action. You can also do things in order to say, uh, obtain or have an experience. You aren't gaining ownership in anything by seeing the sunset, but you you know use means to the end in your actions to maybe see a sunset. So- Or, or if, I, if I pay someone to fly me somewhere- Right, right, right. I'm paying them, the, the, the flight, I don't own the flight. Right. I mean, I, it just gets me to where I wanna go. Or if I pay someone to take me skydiving, at the end of it, I have some memories and some photographs. Right. But I didn't. I didn't buy an object. I, I just paid them to. So I'd say the general way to look at it is every action aims at an end, an end state of affairs, which really means a different universe. Um, and one subset of that universe is that I am in possession of an object, or an ownership of an object. Object. But that's only one subset of the of of, of sets of ends that we pursue. And lots of ends are not catalactic or commercial. They're just things you do on your own, like uh, like, like love. You, you really can't pay a woman to love you. You could pay her to have sex with you, but you can't pay her to love you. Right. You have to really earn that in a certain different way. Um, mm -hmm. But you can even characterize that economically as an exchange, I guess. Mm -hmm. But then you start getting further and further afield. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you say that when information is sold, that amounts to a kind of a one-way title contract. It's right? exactly it's exactly it's exactly like the the sale of an action or the sale of an action or labor because mm -hmm. you're really asking someone to perform an action and that is to provide you with some data. Right. They're tell they're telling you something or they're giving you something. They're, they're performing an action that transmits data to you that satisfies you or they're giving you they're giving you some substrate or some medium that is in pattern in a certain way. Like they might hand you a book. Or they may teach you how to how to speak German. Yeah. So they spend their time teaching you how to speak German. Or they might tell you the secrets to, to quantum physics. So they're giving you information that they took a long time to learn. So they're teaching you something. 
Right. But it's really just it's really just an action. You're, you're trying to induce them to engage in an action. Right. OK, so. Currently, right now, I'm actually and this is one of the reasons why uh, I was wondering a lot about these topics is I'm creating an online course and I'm going to be putting it out probably within the next couple of weeks. So I think this is a good example for us to use and to see how some of these issues intertwine with it. Um, now. This is something I'm actually doing. It's not just hypothetical. Um, and when I say course, that might be misleading nowadays. Course online oftentimes means just like a prepackaged thing. It doesn't necessarily mean course. Like I'm not going to be interacting with anyone who purchases this in a sense of I'm not going to be teaching them as you would one on one. It's sort of all the information that I know on this topic. I put it in audio and video, and I'm gonna I want to sell it online. Mm -hmm. Okay, now. If Wait, let me, let, let, me, let, me, let me step back one second and say a couple of things. I just realized I might have to go in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay. If we're not done, we can pick it up a second time. Mm -hmm. um, and just one thing. People always say, Kinsella, how can you, how can you say that you don't – the copyright's bad because you sell books? And isn't that – in other words, they think that you have to have a copyright to sell a book. Right. Of course you don't. It just means you can't stop other people from selling a similar book. You can always sell a book. You don't need copyright to sell. Copyright's right. not permission to do something. It's just a way to stop other people from doing something. Right. And you can also have contracts. So, so go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, in the case of this course that I'm going to put online, and let's mm -hmm. say that I I agree with you uh, about uh, intellectual property. So I don't demand any like IP or copyright on this course, which I probably won't do. Now, I know uh, as an aside, the law uh, assumes copyright from my understanding. Yeah, right you, now. you have a copyright. Well, you have a copyright in any original work that you fix in the tangible medium of expression. So something that you write down or that you record, you mm -hmm. don't have a copyright if you just uh, talk to people because that's ephemeral. It disappears. Right. It has to be fixed. Now, if you made a recording of it, <coughs> Or if you hand out some notes to people, you have a copyright in that. Okay, this is so it's not whether you copyright it or not. You do have a copyright, um, and and I wouldn't. I I also wouldn't say that all my theories mean that you should never enforce your copyright. That's a moral issue. Yeah. Uh, in today's, I just say the laws. Are, you shouldn't have that law. The law shouldn't exist. But how you how you respond and, and operate within a legal system that's corrupt is a different issue. Right now, let's assume there was no IP in the law. Yeah. And, yeah, that's a better way. Yeah. And I just put this out there. Morally and economically, I would hope that people don't copy it and give it away for free. But correct. I would only hope that on those grounds, I don't demand that there's a law that makes it illegal for them to do so. That's the distinction. So 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 I think what so like Tom Woods has that. So and other people, I like I pay extra money to get access to some of their things, which they don't they don't provide to outsiders. Right. Some of their users could easily copy it and start pirating it. Right. You know, the thing is, even if they do that, they're gonna look like assholes. And, and third of all, second of all, it's just not that useful to outsiders because they kind of want the packaged experience and right, they want it right. easily. So it's still not gonna be that it's not gonna hurt them that much, but Right. That is a risk of doing something where your your business model depends upon something that's easily copyable. Right. Um, I would say that what you want to do is have as the seller or as the provider of a service, if trying to prevent the easy leaking of your proprietary information <coughs> is important to your business model, you have to do it in a certain way that it's not easy for people to take it and put it on the internet. So one model is the paywall, right, to make it a little bit more difficult. But then the more right. you do that, the more you annoy your customers who are actually paying you. Right. You, you could also have a contract with all those people where they all agree not to copy it, and if they do, they owe you some penalty, some fine. But right. but the problem with that is either the either the fine is small or it's large. If it's small, it's not going to really just like if it's ten dollars, one of your one of your one of your customers might just take it and. Put it on the internet and pay the ten dollar fine, and now your information is public domain. Right. Um, so the only way to stop that is to have a very high fine. But who's going to pay you thirty five dollars for a you know ten dollars for a book or fifty dollars for a course if they're signing up for a potential million dollars in liability for right, a right. private? Co so it just is not a business. So if you did that, like if Amazon tried to tried to make in a in a copyright free world, if a bookseller or an author or a publisher. Or Amazon tried to make a customer agree to millions of dollars of potential damages if they use or learn or 
copy this work too much right. that they're paying 10 bucks for. They're just going to say, screw you. I'm going to go get a pirated copy. Right. right. So you, you're just – as a practical matter, I don't think you can you can really restrict your customers too much because these are the people that are actually paying you. Most people are right. pirating it. The few people right. that are actually willing to pay you, you're treating them like shit. I mean you can't do it. Right. So I just think it's an un- – it's, it's, with informational services, it's just unavoidable. Mm-hmm. Now, if you think about it, why do we hire professors and teachers to teach us? Everything they're teaching us is in textbooks. It's public domain right. basically, but right. you hire them because they have a skill at presenting information. So right. you're really usually paying them to perform a service. You know, Like if I, if I pay a juggler to juggle in front of me, I could go watch a video of someone juggling or I could learn to juggle, but I right. want to pay to watch him do it. He's learned how to do it. He's going to entertain me. Right. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you wouldn't you wouldn't oppose um, either one pragmatic restrictions in the sense like you put some kind of difficult like fencing absolutely. digitally and that nope, kind of thing. Absolutely not. Tom Woods does that. I think there's nothing immoral or or unethical or wrong about it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It, if you're doing it for a profit, now if you're doing it for nonprofit like I do, like writing libertarian stuff. The whole purpose is to spread the message, so I think sure. that's silly. It's silly to try to to put it behind paywalls uh, because you're not doing this for money anyway, you know. Right, right. But that would be a different goal. You're trying to get, uh, you know, you're trying to distribute the message and you know gain, you know, like attention in that case. So free makes sense. But if you are trying to do yeah. it for profit, to have these pragmatic constraints, it is still kind of odd to think that you can put some of these restrictions on it, even though you don't own it. But again, we can keep that distinct. It doesn't, you don't have to own yeah, but it. Not, but not really. So it's, it's really exactly like you own your body. So you have the ability to be lazy and not to do what I want you to do. So because you own your body, you don't have to do what I want you to do. So I have to induce you to do it. And even that would include, even though you don't own those subsequent actions, you own your body. But so not the subsequent actions. No, you, action is what you do with your body, right? right? right. It's, just, it's just a motion you perform. Right. So if you say you own your actions or your labor, you're double counting because you're saying you own your body and you do what, you own what you do with it. But owning your body is what gives you the ability to do what you want to do with your body. You see right. what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah. like it's like you don't own your car and the ability to use it. I mean, owning your car is giving you the right yes, yes, to, yes. to use it. I see what you mean. So you wouldn't. So again, you wouldn't oppose either one those pragmatic restrictions on it, nor uh, to uh, some kind even of a con- con- even a contract that contractual, would contractual. I just contractual. I just think, think that, I just think, think practically, they, economically, it's probably not uh, strategically wise because it can induce your potential buyers to uh, of essentially avoid that. It's annoying, or the risk is too high for them to take on, and they're they're actually might induce them actually to go towards uh, pirated or free information. Correct. So yeah. I think really it's better to rely upon reputational issues. Like you have a close knit community. They don't want right. to, they don't want to screw you over. Just like right. people give to Patreon now to support people that are producing. Uh, right. They don't want to ruin the, they don't want to ruin. They like you. They like that you're providing something. They don't want to screw you over. I mean, generally now, if you're, you know, if you're IBM and you're selling, I mean, if you're some big corporation and it's impersonal, there's millions of customers, you know, you lose that personal touch and people you're going to have pirates then. Right. You know? Right. Well, that was my intuition, though, and that kind of like reinforces that that a strategy essentially in this context would be to rely on reputation and essentially the goodwill of the potential buyers. Correct. Right. Um, I do have to go now. I've got to take my yeah. kid to get a COVID shot, which is going to annoy all my libertarian listeners. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's fine. we can pick it up later if there's more. But I think that kind of covers most of it. But uh, why don't you think, think so. about it and talk to me later and let me know if there's more you want to talk about. And I'd be happy to do it. Talk to you more. Okay, great. Sounds good. This was fun. Thanks for doing it. Thanks, Jay. Okay. All right. Bye.